thank you very much uh, to Alex and uh, Wendy and Migraine Canada for inviting me tonight, and and thank you for joining and um, for joining me uh, tonight. We're going to talk about some tips and tricks for uh, preventing migraine, and and hopefully um, you'll learn something that you're going going to help with your migraines and if you have any questions just save them to the end and we can put them in the chat and we'll take a look at them then. These are my disclosures and as you can see I do a lot of uh, speaking and educational events for all the different um, uh, pharmaceutical companies that are involved in migraine. But what we're going to do today we're going to talk about things that you can do to prevent migraine when talk about when to ask for for help from a migraine expert and what to expect and what are those treatment options a doctor can offer so i thought i'd just start with a case this is a sort of a, a, a typical patient that i might see we could sort of talk about her preventative uh, journey. She's a 25-year-old woman, uh, worked full-time for a PR company, enjoys yoga, but struggles with insomnia, and has had headaches since the age of 13. They occur mostly around the time of her period, but can but have increased in frequency, so they're occurring at other times, so about four to six times a month at, at other times other than her period. Pain is bilateral. It's, it's not that knock em dead kind of pain. It's that grinding six out of 10 achy pain. It's worse with physical activity, not associated with nausea or vomiting, but she prefers to avoid bright lights. And right now she's been treating it by lying down and she may or may not take Tylenol. So the diagnosis here is migraine. And unfortunately patients like, um, like Chelsea often get missed, mostly because she's not describing a unilateral headache that's wiping her off her feet and putting her to bed. And I think it's important for people to realize that they may also have migraine, that what they've been thinking is tension type may be migraine. So what qualifies for migraine? Well, the patient must have had five episodes. If untreated, they last four to 72 hours, and you must have two of the following four things. So unilateral, throbbing, moderate to severe, and worsened with physical activity. And then two, or one of the following two things, nausea or vomiting or light and sound sensitivity. So if we go back to Chelsea, who has more moderate headaches, but they're increasing in frequency, she does qualify. There are sixes out of 10, that's moderate. It's worse with activity and she has light sensitivity. Chelsea has migraine, and this is important, and it's important to recognize it because this opens up all the treatments that are available for migraine, and they're really increasing. Sometimes you might hear the word chronic migraine, and, and I think it can be a little misleading because chronic, we always think, oh, that's somebody who must have had chronic migraines most of their life. But what it really refers to is somebody who has a lot of migraine. So 15 headache days a month of more, of which eight of those days fulfill that criteria for migraine, and it's been going on for three months. It's a special category because there's certain drugs that are uh, applicable to patients who have chronic migraine rather than episodic migraine. So, you know, migraine is often um, misdiagnosed as sinus headache, and, and why is that? Well, you know, there's a certain amount of overhead. Both conditions can have pain over the sinuses. But migraine is mediated by the trigeminal nerve and C1, C2, and C3. So trigeminal nerve have branches over the forehead, over the cheeks, through the jaw, and over the back of the head and the shoulders. And so um, when a patient has migraine, they can have my pain over the sinuses. Um, so both sinus headache and migraine pain can be pressure can be throbbing. They can both be associated with tearing and nasal congestion. Um, they both can be triggered by changes in weather. But true sinus headaches, they have thick discolored nasal discharge. Um, their face pain can be pressure, and the, but there's decreased smell or no smell. 
So the real question is, what can you do to reduce your migraines? Now you know you have migraines. So this is my approach um, in the clinic. And it's, you know, there's lots of different things that you as an individual can do. We're going to talk about lifestyle modification. I understand you, somebody's already spoken to you about supplements. So we're just going to touch on that lightly in case you, you weren't able to attend that talk. And we'll talk about uh, neurostimulation. We'll talk a bit about expectations. What can you expect from, from these, these preventative uh, steps? And importantly, when to ask for help. Oh goodness, there we go, lifestyle modification. Let's take a look at this. So first of all, um, you know, migraineurs have this lowered migraine threshold that other people don't have. And it could be genetic or it could be a result of say trauma to the head. And then there's different things that bring the patient closer to this lower threshold. Could be menses, could be missed night sleep. And either of these things might not be sufficient to trigger a migraine, but have them occur on the same day, boom, away you go. And so it's often very difficult for a patient to identify a trigger because they're additive like this, that on its own, chocolate might be fine, or a glass of red wine might be fine, but have it on the same day as the barometric pressure is changing, you might not be noticing that one, and the two are additive and you get the migraine the migraine. So what I recommend to patients is, is, um, is, uh, you know, taking, so first of all, um, leading a very moderate life. We want to try and eliminate these ups and downs uh, so that you want to go to bed the same time every night and wake up the same time every morning, regardless if it's a weekday or a weekend. You want that routine of small, frequent meals so your blood sugar isn't going up and down. Um, try and walk 30 minutes a day. So we're trying to keep things very, very even. And we'll talk about some dietary things in a moment. There are um, risk factors that um, lead to migraine progression. Now, there's some things we can't modify. So age, you know, increasing age, um, uh, female sex, low education or socioeconomic stat status and head injury are, do, do lead to migraine or can lead to migraine pro um, progression or identified as risk factors. Not much we can do about those things. But there are other things we can modify. So, um, you know, looking at attack frequency. Well, what's modifiable about that? Well, over to the right there on the next box, we could go on a preventative medication to reduce the attack frequency. One thing we know is that migraine begets migraine and it just sort of spirals and spirals until suddenly, you know, somebody is having attacks more often, more days of the month than not. Um, so we wanna put somebody on to prevent that, that nasty trajectory. Obesity has been linked um, with progression, so weight loss, stressful life events. And um, although we'd love to live stress-free, gosh, I know I would, um, it's not realistic. We all have to work and you know manage kids and a family and all those things that we juggle. And, um, but having a way of managing stress is important. And there's different ways of doing it. I, mean, I like to walk, I like to do yoga. But there's uh, uh, walking, first of all, is, is meditative. Dalai Lama considers it a form of meditation. Uh, there's journaling, other forms of exercise. Um, and, and so it's about finding what, um, what fits you. The other thing is caffeine. Now, um, not everybody is caffeine sensitive. And some of you have probably found that if you can have a coffee and a little bored of migraine. But some people are so sensitive that if they have coffee every day, it predisposes them to more headache. 
And sometimes just eliminating that last coffee can make all the difference. And especially in those patients who are waking up every morning with a headache, mix that, mix that caffeine. You might be one of these people who, who, have, um, who are sensitive to it. Snoring can uh, lead to progression, and um, often there is um, what's called a habitus, but, uh, sort of a short neck, often, often overweight, not necessarily, uh, but weight loss can help. A CPAP machine can help and reduce snoring. Allodynia. So what, what does the allodynia mean? Allodynia is when non-nauseous stimuli feel painful. So, you know, sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes my feels like somebody's punched me in the side of the head. Not when I have the headache, but after. It's, it's when I lightly touch my head. This feels like it's bruised, but it's not. And that's called allodynia. Sometimes things like a necklace um, will feel painful and he heavy. That's a form of allodynia. And um, we find that if we can abort the headache early, it can help prevent allodynia or if we put people on preventative medications, they can prevent allodynia. Now, many of you will probably have other pain syndromes because you know my patients who have the worst migraines often have lots of other pain things going on. It's part of this pain begets pain. And so it's really important to treat um, chronic pain because if there's pain going elsewhere, pain in your shoulder, your neck, or even chronic knee pain, it winds the system up. The brain becomes more sensitive. And so we need to try and settle all that pain down. So it's important to treat those as our conditions. Lastly, medication overuse. And, um, you know, it's easy to get caught up in it, right? We're told, you know, if you want to abort a migraine, you need to take it right at the start of the headache because that is the way to abort a migraine. But if you have too many of those, then what happens is you're taking the medication uh, more and more frequently. And if you're taking your triptans 10 days a month or more, you may have headaches secondary to the triptans. Or if you're taking your over-the-counter medications 15 days a month or more, again, you may have um, medication overuse. So things to keep in mind. Now, other lifestyle modifications. And I mentioned these are tricky, right? Because they're additive. And it varies from person to person. And it's important to remember, I know people say I, I, I live the healthiest life and, and I know so many of you do so much. Uh, I really like, do not have any sins left in life because just trying to control your migraines. But what I, for those of you who haven't done this, done the elimination diet, the thing to do is just choose one thing initially, right? Is it sometimes they're healthy foods like citrus. Take citrus out for three months, not with the expectation of being headache free, uh, but are they less frequent? Uh, are they less intense or, or are you able to treat them more easily? If you are, then maybe that's one of those additive triggers. Keep them out. If nothing's changed, take them back in and enjoy it. So, and, and there's a long list of triggers and it varies. Some people it's cheese or chocolate, red wine's a bad one. Um, but there's, um, you know, we hear about monosodium uh, glutamate, but it's the glutamate in monosodium glutamate that's the problem. And here we can have glutamate and seaweed, glutamate and miso. So if you like your Japanese food, you got to watch for that. But glutamate occurs naturally in tomatoes. So there are some of these triggers that are, are, are hidden in healthy foods. Um, we talked about sleep being important, but not too much sleep, not too little sleep. Changes in barometric pressure can be real triggers. And sadly, there isn't really anything we can do about that. If you want to move to Arizona, where it's always a nice steady high. We talked about stress management and um, altitude can be a, a trigger. So if you're a hiker, a skier, a mountain climber, you might notice it at altitude. But some of you may also notice it when you're in a plane because um, the uh, pressure isn't, isn't uh, although isn't quite the same as it is, uh, the, as it is at ground level. And uh, air flight can also trigger um, trigger migraines. And really the best thing to do is be prepared and have your migraine medications with you on that flight. 
Okay, so we talked about some lifestyle modifications. How about um, supplements and, and, neuro, and neurostimulation? So uh, there are some supplements that have been demonstrated in a meta-analysis um, and are supported in the guidelines, the Canadian Headache Society guidelines. These are my favorites, um, and these are the ones supported in the Canadian uh, guidelines. So riboflavin, 400 milligrams a day, coenzyme Q10, 100 milligrams, three times a day, and magnesium citrate, 200 milligrams, three times a day. Um, I, I used to have butter burr on there, um, and there were some cases of hepatic failure um, in patients who were taking butter burr. None of that happened in Canada, but uh, it, it happened here in Europe, and we don't know where you get your source of butter burr from, so uh, I just, I, I don't recommend it, uh, but there is evidence that, that that works. Now, the interesting thing is that doesn't work right away. It takes four to six weeks before it starts to kick in. So I recommend a good three month trial before you decide whether or not this works for you. So what about neurostimulation? Uh, you might be familiar with the Cephaly device. And uh, here, I think Wonder Woman must have been a migrainer because it looks like she's wearing it too. The gentleman in the picture there, that's, that's what the Cephaly device really looks like. And you can get this actually online through Costco without a prescription. Uh, and there is some evidence for its use. So what it is, um, it, it, you put it on and there are um, two protocols, one to abort a migraine and it, and it stimulates the supertrochlear, superorbital nerves. The other protocol is to prevent migraine where you wear it 20 minutes every day. So I will tell you 20 minutes, it turns out, is a long time every day. And a lot of my patients who've got this have told me they find it difficult to find 20 minutes. And you would think most of us might be able to do it washing the dishes or watching TV, but that's a tough habit. But um, so what was the data? So when they they had um, Verum, so that was the, the treatment group versus sham, there was really no significant difference in the reduction of migraine days. But when they looked at something called the 50% responder rate, so, so you can un understand this because it's sometimes hard to explain. 50% responder rate refers to the percentage of patients who had a 50% reduction in their migraines. Those who use the Cephaly device, 38% or 38.1% had um, a 50% reduction in their migraines versus those who were on a placebo who only had a 12%. So it's, it's not a drug. Um, you can take it with your drugs and it might help. So uh, I think it costs about $350, Costco online. There you go. So what to expect from, from treatment options? Let's take a look. Well, first of all, you're not gonna come headache free. And I, uh, yeah, honestly, we'd all love, I'm a migrainer. I would love to get rid of my migraines. Um, and it, but it's not a realistic expectation. Um, and so really what we're aiming for is an improvement in your quality of life, okay? Usually these medications, if we're, like we talked about the supplements taking four to six weeks before they start to kick in, um, you'll find that the oral medications a, a doctor might prescribe also takes four to six weeks before it kicks in. So I sometimes will see patients who go, okay, so what have you tried? And go, oh, well, I tried propranolol for a week. And I said, well, why did you stop it? What are the side effects? Oh, no, no, I, it's just I, a week later, I had a migraine. Well, a week later, you will have a migraine because it will take four to six weeks uh, before it even start to work. And you will still get migraines. A win in the migraine world is a reduction in your frequency by 50%. And so when we're talking about prevention. So if that drug you're on has cut your migraines in half, that's a good one. You might want to consider staying on it and perhaps, you know, um, talking, using some of these other things we looked at, the Cephaly device, adding in supplements, doing those lifestyle changes.
The next thing here, when to ask for help. Well, first of all, if your migraines are not responding to over-the-counter medications, you should see um, a doctor because there are prescription medications um, that can help. So the prescription anti-inflammatories that are stronger than the ones you can get over the counter. There are triptans, many of you will have tried that. And in the new year, there will be the GPAMs, which are again, a migraine specific drug, which has a very different mechanism of action. So if, you're, if your Tylenol level isn't working, seek some help. There's no point in losing time at work, time away from your family and just, and just suffering. If your migraines are starting to creep up, so you know, three, you know, if you take, have three migraines and you can abort it with Tylenol and Advil, wonderful. I wouldn't worry about it. You know, if you're getting up to around six, that's when you need to start thinking about um, preventing a migraine because migraines beget migraines and they start ramping up and they start getting more and more. They're impairing your quality of life. It doesn't matter what the number is. If they're wiping you out, um, you're fearing, you're, you're worried about, you're not gonna be able to go to your next event because you have, you're gonna get a migraine, you know, you need to do something about that. And really any patient who has chronic migraine, 15 headache days a month or more, we need, you really need to see a physician because the chance of this settling down um, on its own is, a lot less likely and likely will require some sort of medication and intervention. Um, so what can a doctor offer for migraine prevention? But these are the, um, the Canadian guidelines um, for uh, first line therapy. Many of you will be familiar with them. Um, so down in the bottom, um, are the supplements, the butterbur, the riboflavin, coenzyme Q10, and magnesium citrate. As you can see, the quality of evidence for them is low. Now, that doesn't mean um, they don't work. What it means was the studies were poorly designed, and, uh, you know, they might have only lasted six weeks when we would expect them last 12 weeks. Uh, there weren't many people in them. All right, but it's a first line recommendation because the side effects, side effect profile is really good. You're unlikely to have side effects from them and they may help. At the top, we have drugs which have good quality of evidence and, and, and a strong recommendation. Just mention them um, briefly. You know, all, all drugs potentially have side effects. And, you know, when we're trying to decide the right medication for you, it's about weighing um, other, other conditions you might have. So say you um, suffer from insomnia, and the trip plane fourth down on that list might be a good option for you. Uh, yeah, I recommend you take it a couple hours before bed and it can cause drowsiness during the night. Um, and you might like that if you have insomnia. What we don't want is you to still have a drowsiness in the morning. Some people are very sensitive to that. Um, generally, at low doses, there isn't any weight gain, but that may be a risk. Topiramate at the top of the list, however, won't cause weight gain and may cause weight loss. But pretty much everyone can get tingling in their fingers and toes. They can put up with that usually. But there's... Um, I don't know, uh, there's a, a low percentage of patients who will not feel cognitively sharp on it, which is not a nice side effect. It's dose dependent to me. Start low, gradually go up, and often we can overcome it. Metoprolol, propolol, propranolol, metoprolol and propranolol, um, old drugs um, that we know well, but it decreases heart rate and can decrease blood pressure and it can make you feel draggy out. So we might use it in an older person who has good buoyant blood pressure and will be able to tolerate that. So we need to know bits more about the individual when we make those choices. Then we have drugs with weak recommendation, but still good quality of evidence. 
And the only reason it's a weak recommendation is that those drugs tend to have a bit more side effects. So you really, the doctor really needs to know their patient um, to know if those are the right ones for their patient. Lastly, at the bottom uh, are, the, are the migraine specific drugs. And these aren't in the Canadian guidelines yet because the Canadian guidelines were back in 2012. And um, these, uh, these hadn't come out yet. So on a bot, um, actually it was 2011, it was approved in Canada, but just for chronic migraine, and we don't have chronic migraine guidelines specifically in Canada. It's approved by Health Canada and, and um, many, well, all the headache doctors use it, many of the neurologists use it, and it's very effective. We have the CGRP monoclonal antibodies. These are self-injectable drugs that are very effective uh, also in um, reducing migraine frequency and intensity. In 2023, we'll have a new, new oral drug called the G-Pants. This will be taken daily or every other day, depending on the brand, um, and can be used both for migraine prevention and also to treat a migraine. So um, we are hoping to update the Canadian uh, guidelines. We thought maybe this year, maybe the end of next year. Um, it's a big, big task. But these are some of the options that may be out there for you. So let's go back to Chelsea. What happened with her? Well, remember, young girl, she did have insomnia um, and depression, onset of headache at 13 mostly around her menses, but at other times, four to six other times. So the frequency was climbing, bilateral, achy, so more of a grinding pain, which you could probably get through her day, worse with exertion, uh, prefer to avoid the bright lights, last six to eight hours. And she was just using it with, uh, treating it with Tylenol. So uh, actually, I prescribed her an anti-inflammatory. I chose Cambia. It's um, a powder that you put in um, an ounce of water, very fast acting. Um, and uh, this would work for most of her migraines, but not all. And for ones that it wasn't, com uh, Cambia wouldn't completely abort it, I put her on a triptan called Axer. So it was a stepwise approach to aborting her migraines. These um, shortened her migraines to two hours. Um, she tried some supplements because that was her first preference, but there wasn't a benefit. So um, I started her on amitriptyline and that really helped her sleep. It actually decreased her migraines. So from six down to two, but she gained weight. Um, and usually at 30 milligrams, we're okay, but she was sensitive to it. So we switched her over to topiramate. Um, and, and this poor girl is very sensitive. She got cognitive slowing for this. Um, we tried increasing the dose. We were trying to get up 100 milligrams, couldn't get there. And she was having six migraines per month at the lower dose. And so we thought, okay, that's it. You failed to oral drugs. Let's try one of these migraine specific drugs. So I put her on Amivig. This is a self injectable um, monoclonal antibody once a month. And her migraine frequency decreased to two to three per month. She said the migraines were less intense as well. And they all responded to cambia. So instead of being on a daily oral, with side effects. She was on the aim of A. She didn't have the cognitive slowing. She was able to continue to work. She did have some constipation with the aim of it. She was just treating it with um, an over-the-counter um, medication with Storlax. But after six months, she said that the uh, constipation was off. So um, now Chelsea also had talked about what we call comorbidities, um, other conditions that we commonly see in migraine. It's a bit circular. We know patients who have migraine are more likely to develop depression. Patients who have the, 
than the normal population. Patients who have depression are two to three times more likely to develop migraine than the normal uh, population. They're, they're intertwined. Um, yet Chelsea reported improvement in both her mood and her sleep. Um, despite not being on any other medications. And, and so um, what we find is that, um, th that some of these medications, these migraine-specific medications, also help mood and sleep. So, if, um, for example, this was a study. They were just looking at patients in Italy who were on Amavig. And um, what they did was they looked at their MIDAS scores. Some of you may be familiar with MIDAS. It looks for, for your... Um, and it looks at migraine disability, migraine impact uh, uh, disability score. And so the patients who were on the EMAVIG there, um, they had a significant reduction in their migraine disability. Um, this is the Beck's depression score. And there was also a significant reduction in their um, uh, Beck's depression score and also the GAD7, which monitors or is a measurement of anxiety. Uh, on a botulinum toxin, again, a, a migraine specific uh, drug, it also works to reduce CGRP. And in this, uh, they looked at patients who had chronic migraine and depression. And their the way they monitored depression was using a depression score called the PHQ-9. And it just was a, que a, a depression questionnaire. And as we can see, the longer the patients were on the onabotulinum toxin, the, the lower their score got. This was significantly different over time. And then the same thing when they uh, looked at anxiety. Um, and we also mentioned issues of sleep that we commonly see in migraine. And uh, this was a study um, by a colleague of, and friend of mine, uh, Andrew Blumenfeld, who uh, looked at uh, sleep as well. And they looked at um, reductions in their sleep, um, their, their quality of sleep index. And so at baseline, it was 13.3 and reducing down to 11, uh, also with a reduction in fatigue as well. And these were considered to be statistically significant. So it's interesting, this close um, relationship between migraine, depression, anxiety, and sleep. And that if you help the migraines, at least with some of these newer drugs, those other things can also improve. Anyway, so that's the end of my talk. We talked about some of the things we could do to prevent migraine. We talked about lifestyle modifications, supplements, and, and neurostimulators, which don't require um, uh, referrals or prescriptions. Talked about when to ask help from a medical expert. When your quality of life is impaired, your acute medications are not working, you're just getting too many migraines. Uh, what treatments can doctors offer? Well, Mostly after you've done all those other preventative things, then they will go in and, and focus on medications, the oral medications, and in Canada for the insurance companies to cover you for uh, those migraine-specific drugs. One must have failed two orals, but those migraine-specific drugs can offer a lot of help.